You're watching NASA TV. from NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. We are thrilled to be joined today by NASA astronaut Mark Vandehei, who returned to Earth last Wednesday, March 30th, after a record-setting 355-day mission to the International Space Station, the longest space flight ever by an American astronaut. Mark, congratulations on a successful mission, and thank you for joining us today. It has been wonderful to watch you performing important science on board the station for the past year, but it's also great to have you home. Now I'll hand it over to Mark for remarks, and then we'll take questions. Media on the phone, please press star one to ask a question and star two to withdraw a question if it's already been asked. You can also ask questions on social media using the hashtag AskNASA. Mark? Thanks, Megan, uh, and thanks to everybody for joining us here today. As Megan mentioned, it's, it was uh, a 355-day mission. I keep hearing a, about this being a record-setting mission, but I really wanted to flex that as a record, f uh, not my own personal record so much as a record for the whole team, because this type of long-duration flight is something we need to do to help uh, further our ability to explore further and further away from our home planet Earth. We had 60 to 100 experiments going on at any given moment on the space station. Some of those we didn't have to interact with other than making sure the facility was working properly. Other ones we got to uh, interact with directly. One that comes to mind is celestial immunity, where we were able to take uh, cells donated from younger adults and older adults and inoculate them to see how our immune systems react to the rigors of spaceflight. So that's, again, one example of, of many, many more types of, of science we're doing on board. I really don't want to talk too long right now because I've always had more fun answering questions and talking to you about what you want to hear about rather than uh, what I think you want to hear about. So let's get, let's get going. All right, let's do it. We'll take the first question from Marsha Dunn with the Associated Press. Uh, welcome back, Mark. Uh, as NASA's new space endurance champ who saw Taurus drop by the space station, I'd like your take on the upcoming Axiom mission, if I might. My understanding is the Axiom crew is going to have pretty much free reign on the U.S. side of the station. And what are your thoughts about that? Could that be intrusive, even dangerous? Or maybe it's nice to have non-traditional visitors to break up the monotony and, um, and maybe also a, a quick rundown on how you're feeling. So we had, I feel very fortunate in retrospect, having had the experience of having uh, visiting non-governmental astronauts visiting the space station um, with our space flight participants from um, Russia as well as Japan. We were, we anticipated that might be challenging, but in every case we were pleasantly surprised and it was a joy to see people come on board and be thrilled about uh, being up there with us, it uh, quite honestly felt reinvigorating. It didn't feel challenging. Axiom will be a little different, not in uh, being less enthusiastic, but I think they will, they will be there living on the U.S. segment, and we haven't had that before. Um, but we have had that many people working on the space station before so, for similar periods of time. So I think it's something that will work smoothly, and it, I expect it to work out to be just fine. And as far as how I'm feeling, it's wonderful to be back. Uh, there are some aches and pains that I did not have before that I'm getting lots of help in resolving. So I look forward to those getting resolved, um, but we're making steady progress in that direction. All right, great. We'll take the next question from Lauren Grush with The Verge. Hi, Mark. So good to have you back here on Earth with us. Um, I'm sure a lot of us are curious what it was like as you all received the news of the invasion while on board the space station. Was it a topic of discussion among you and the crew and the other cosmonauts? And if so, how did you address what was happening on the ground? Thanks. 
Well, I think like every, uh, all of us watching that news, it's heartbreaking, very sad. Um, and there's a sense of powerless that goes along with it when you see people that are in need of help and you don't feel like there's anything you can do. It was, for me personally, it was not a topic I shied away from with my crewmates. They weren't very long discussions, but I did ask them how they were feeling or, and sometimes ask pointed questions. Uh, but our focus really was uh, on our mission together. And w speaking specifically about my relationship with my Russian crewmates, they were, are, and will continue to be very dear friends of mine. Um, we supported each other th throughout everything. And uh, I never had any concerns about my ability to continue working with them. Very good professionals, technically competent, and wonderful human beings. So I will always be happy that I was able to, to be on the space station with them. All right, next question comes from Robert Perlman with Collect Space. Hi. Um, you mentioned some new aches and pains, but can you compare your Soyuz landings? How, diff how different was it coming back to Earth after 168 days versus 355 days? And how much more difficult of an experience do you think it would be for someone to approach or surpass um, Valery Pol Polyakov's record of 438 days today? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of being able to be successful on the space station or any place remotely for that long is gonna be uh, how you deal with your own mental health. So that requires a lot of emphasis. And I, I felt better on this space flight, the longer one, than on the previous one, because I really did put a lot of work into uh, kind of the conversations I would have with myself, my own internal voice. So that helped a lot. Um, as far as the differences between the two flights, they, I would say, the process coming home, for example, I didn't have as many responsibilities in the Russian spacecraft this time. Last time I was a co-pilot. This time I was in the same seat that might have been a tourist seat. So I had very little to do, which gave me a lot of time to look out the window and observe. And that was really ple a, a pleasant experience for me, getting to notice things that I hadn't noticed before. But also sometimes having had the experience of landing in that Russian spacecraft, you hit very hard when you hit the ground. Um, this time, I think it was harder anticipating the impact than it was actually experiencing it. So um, it, it, and also we had, for some reason I don't understand yet, we did experience a higher G load as we were going through the atmosphere, sl getting slowed down by the atmosphere. So I certainly felt that as well, but it was all good. All right, next question comes from David Curley with Discovery Channel. Uh, welcome home. Um, I want to go back to, um your crewmates and the discussion of the invasion, uh, not so much them, but uh, I know you get news reports, and, boy, we were all talking about it down here with what uh, was going on between Scott Kelly and uh, the man who runs Roscosmos. Uh, did any of that filter up to you? And can you tell us what you saw outside looking down on the reentry that was interesting on the second reentry? Thanks. Sure. Yeah, certainly I heard about that, uh, that Twitter back and forth between Scott Kelly and Rogozin. Um, I never took any of, uh, I just didn't spend a lot of emotional energy paying attention to it. I heard about it, I, I kind of laughed it off and moved on. The uh, re-entry, interesting things about re-entry, uh, kind of out of the, my peripheral vision, the uh, you see a lot of sparks as, as the spacecraft heats up and parts of the spacecraft ablate away. That's one of the ways the spacecraft is designed to get rid of all that energy and we, so we don't experience the heat inside. This time, though, being able to focus outside, it looked like pretty big chunks of melted material going by, which I thought was pretty amazing. The other thing that really got my attention, looking completely out the window, was I hadn't realized before how much the spacecraft oscillates back and forth. So as I was seeing this beautiful view of the Earth, it, it looked like the Earth was swinging back and forth past the window. And uh, I realized that if I kept looking out the window all the time, I was gonna start feeling a little nauseous. So I looked inside and started focusing on the displays and it made everything seem very, very stable because nothing in the spacecraft was oscillating back and forth. All right, let's go to Nicholas Notario with ABC 13. Hello and welcome back, uh, Mark. I have a, going off of that last question, just 
curious to know, you know, I talked to uh, former astronaut Clayton Anderson. He said that when he was up there with, with the cosmonauts, he certainly would be having conversations with them about what was going on. And then knowing that you were landing in Kazakhstan, he probably would have been mapping out how far that was to Russia uh, when he was coming down. So I was curious to know what conversations you may have had with them. And then also moving forward, there continues to be discussion about the future of ISS and what the sanctions could mean on the Russian program and possibly the ISS plumbing to the earth. Just wondering what your thoughts are on the future of ISS, knowing that the war in Ukraine is still taking place. Sure. I, I did have discussions with my crewmates, but it was largely how they felt about things. And those are things that I would prefer that they get to share directly rather than me sharing how they feel about it. The future of the space station and conflict between Russia and the United States, honestly, I think that's one of the reasons we've been able to have an international space station. Some people that don't care so much about space care about international relations. And having a space station where we um, can cooperate, I think, is really important for a peaceful future. So that's my answer to that. Let's go to Mark Caro with Aviation Week. Thank you. Um, what's most satisfying about your experience uh, in terms of contributions to future uh, space exploration, and how maybe did this mission change your sense of how humanly feasible it would be to travel to Mars for a round trip? This mission certainly um, enhanced my perception of feasibility for uh, people surviving long duration. I do think it's very important that you follow the exercise protocols that NASA gives you because they do keep you healthy. And I worked really, really hard at that and it has helped me out a lot. I, I was able to walk on my own within, uh, gosh, eight hours after being, it was certainly wobbly, but eight hours later, um, while we were getting refueled on the flight home, I uh, was pretty functional. Um, I'm still uncomfortable, but uh, humans are very adaptable, and I think that bodes well. What's satisfying for me is uh, as uh, being myself, my body is part of the experiment. So I know people are going to have to go get data from me uh, and my contributions to that data that will help people further explore is certainly very, very satisfying because as I get older, I'm sure I'm going to be watching those things as people that are much younger than me. Uh, do some amazing things. There's a lot of challenges ahead, and it's going to be exciting. Okay, let's take the next question from Rachel Crane with CNN. Thank you so much for doing this, Mark. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'm sure I speak for all the sport space reporters on the call here that we have sort of been glued to Dmitry Rogozin's Twitter uh, recently, and I'm curious to know how closely you guys pay attention to that feed up on ISS, particularly when there are published what were perceived as, you know, a possible abandonment of you on station. How seriously did you take that at all? Uh, and how closely you yourself are monitoring his Twitter feed? Thanks so much. I think there's a wide variety of uh, how astronauts pay attention to social media. I never directly looked at social media. I just, I did listen to a lot of podcasts about things. And quite honestly, I heard about the tweets from my wife. Um, I never perceived those, uh, those tweets as anything to take seriously as far as, um, I, I just had too much confidence in um, our cooperation to date to, to take that those tweets as anything but uh, something that was meant for a different audience than myself. Okay, let's go to Chris Davenport with the Washington Post. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm just curious, are you involved in any kind of long-term experiments going forward to test your body and the effects of the long-term uh, space flights on you? And um, also just curious about your thoughts and when the Russian crew came up in the yellow and blue suits there's a lot of talk about that down here. I'm just curious if that's something you guys talked about up there. Thanks. Okay, so the first question was about, can you repeat the first question again? Yeah, just if you're involved in any experiments long term to you know, study the effects of your uh, mission on your body. So all, all of the U.S. astronauts that go to space are, are uh, a small group of people 
and there is data gathered from uh, astronauts throughout their entire lives. My, I'm sure because my data, my, my experience is a little bit different, th there might be some different uh, uses for that. Um, but I fully expect for the rest of my life to be getting checked out and uh, that information hopefully will be useful. Um, as far as the, uh, the yellow flight suits, I, I, I think the uh, folks that wore them had no, it, had no idea that people would perceive that as having anything to do with Ukraine because they chose those because all three of them happened to be associated with uh, the same university and those are the school colors for that. I think they were kind of blindsided by it. Let's take a question from Andrea Leinfelder with the Houston Chronicle. Hi, welcome home. Um, one of the experiments you're participating in was eating repetitive meals to see if space flight change that peel certain foods over time. And, and I'm curious, how long did you participate in the study? What did you eat? And how did it affect you mentally? How does it affect your mood? Thanks. Oh, great questions. Food certainly affects uh, people's moods a lot. I, it's interesting. I never perceived it as a repetitive study. I actually felt like I had a tremendous variety of food. There, was, there were some requirements for me eat a minimum amount of fish. I like fish, so they actually had to tell me to eat less fish. Um, I had a minimum requirement for ve uh, fruits and vegetables as well, and uh, lycopene-rich foods. But all those foods are types of foods that I enjoy, so it didn't seem restrictive at all. Okay, we have a couple of questions coming in from social media. On Twitter, one person's asking that um, space flights can have a negative effect on your eyesight. Have you noticed any differences with that? It's a great timing for that question. I just got my eye exam yesterday. I'm happy to report that there's no change in my prescription. Uh, I wasn't certain that was going to be the case, but I wouldn't be surprised at just getting older that I'm going to have changes in my prescription. So there, for me, fortunately, there was nothing. And I think uh, by an... I, my understanding is um, if even the changes people have might have experienced, those uh, have been able to be recovered from so far. We are paying very close attention because there, are risk, there is a risk of that, and our eyes get studied very carefully. We do lots of data gathering on the status of our eyes with some very impressive equipment while we're in orbit. All right. And we have a lot of people on tw Twitter asking, do you wish you had 10 more days in space to make it a full year? Wow, interesting question. Um, it, it, only because it would make the sound bites shorter, that would be it. There's really, I'm very happy to be back. I'm, uh, if, if it ended up being 300 days, I still would have felt really good about the mission. It was not about any record for me at all. It's just the opportunity to, to work with a really good sense of purpose in a job where we get to help out all of humanity the number of days was not that important to me, and I think that helped me react to whether it was going to be comfortable with it being either a shorter mission or a longer mission like it turned out to be. All right. Uh, another question from Twitter. What will the next few months look like for you? What will your rehab be like? I've got a couple hours of rehab every day, including weekends, with some very good uh, folks. They're, I, I've been really appreciative of the fact that they're putting my... my my recovery under such scrutiny. So that's good. Uh, I'm Certainly, there's a lot of science data to be gathered as well as I'm back here on the ground. So I'm continuing to, to provide samples and uh, respond to surveys, for example. And uh, other than that, I really haven't looked past the next couple of weeks, quite honestly. I, I typically am busy enough in one day that staying focused on that has been plenty. All right. Jennifer on Facebook asks, what is the biggest adjustment, physically or emotionally, when you first got to the space station and then also when you got home? So the emotion I had when I first got to the space station was that it, it was shockingly familiar, being my second flight. The space station, it's hard to, space station living is so different from being on Earth that once you're on Earth, it's really hard to connect with your experience on the space station. So when I got back there, it felt like I was getting this amazing opportunity to relive childhood memories, something that seemed so distant, but it was there and vivid in all the details. So that was a really interesting emotional experience. And then coming back to Earth, 
it shocked me over the last couple of days because in anticipation of returning to Earth after being away for so long, I really thought that I was going to carry forward with me this unique perspective of appreciation for all things novel about being on the planet. But I'm adapting so quickly, it's, it's becoming, I'm a little disappointed with how normal it feels. I kind of want it to seem uh, more, more strange being back, but it's, I'm, very, I'm shocked at how quickly it's becoming normal. All right. Well, we'll take a couple of more questions from the phone. Nick Natario with ABC 13. Hey, Mark, question. Um, how do you want your record setting mission to be remembered? Is it, do you want it to be remembered for showing how despite what was going on on Earth with the conflict, that cooperation can still exist in space? Or do you want it to be remembered for contributions for what could come with deep, deep space exploration? And then a, a second question, uh, now that you're back in Houston, which is known for its amazing food, uh, what was the first thing you did or ate once you came back to the Houston area? Okay, so the first question, I want this 355 days to be re uh, remembered as the record that got broken. So I'm really looking forward to the next person doing something longer um, and us uh, getting further and further away and exploring more. So I, I want this to be remembered as a stepping stone. As far as food, um, on the NASA aircraft that brought us back from Kazakhstan, one of my flight doctors had the makings of guacamole. And I had made it known that I really enjoy and looking forward to some good avocados. And maybe it's the fact that I hadn't had guacamole for 355 days, but that guacamole was amazing. It was really good. That's great. All right, the next one from Robert Perlman with Collect Space. Robert, we can't hear you if you're asking your question. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you. Um, I, given your experience and looking towards the future, what crew support systems or creature comforts that you had on ISS do you think need to be on board Gateway so that when crews go there, even for short stays, they don't just survive there but enjoy the experience? Easy answer. Windows. That sounds good. All right, next question from Marcia Smith with spacepolicyonline.com. Uh, thanks so much. And my question is along those same lines and thinking about going to Mars. And you said that your 355 days sort of gave you a, a new appreciation for what that would be like physically. But you also talked about the mental, uh, being ready to do these things mentally. Could you talk about the psychological aspects of being away from your family and how you think that would feel if you were as far away from Mars and you had the time delay and the everything. What kind of advice would you give to the people who are planning how to psychologically support astronauts going as far away as Mars? Yeah, I think in a situation where you're going to Mars and you're looking back at the Earth and you would basically be trying to pick out what looks like a faintly blue star, that's going to be challenging for human beings. That is a long, long way away, um, distance-wise. So anything you can do to help people feel connected with those important relationships back on Earth is going to be really important. Uh, videos that you can send, um, videos that you can receive. Uh, I think messaging is going to become more and more important because it'll get harder and harder to have. It's really hard to have a conversation with the type of delays that you'd be experiencing in Mars, at Mars. So, um, yeah, that, that'll be challenging. And I think uh, we've been doing a wonderful job of identifying the challenges and coming up with solutions. So I expect that to be successful in the future, too. Okay, let's go to David Curley with Discovery Channel. Thanks again, Mark. Um, I asked this to Crew 4, and Christina Cook has talked a little bit about it. It, it's about space culture, and you talked a little bit about space station living. Can you describe what space culture, living with people in small surroundings and, and internationally as well, how is it different than being a regular old Earthling? 
So I think space culture changes with every group of people. I think it's probably a, to get a really good understanding of uh, space culture is kind of like trying to get a really good understanding of the culture of a team that's trying to do some type of expedition like going to Mount Everest. It depends a lot on the personalities of the people that you're with. So I'm very happy to say that uh, with all of my crews on orbit, the cultures were good. They were different though. They were uh, different ways to approach problems, different ways to uh, resolve conflict. Um, but in every case, everybody was very, very supportive of each other. And that was a, a crucial part of it. Being able to trust each other is an essential aspect of not just what I would call space culture, but any, any time you have a small group of people that's going to do something very challenging, isolated apart from a lot of other people. All right, we'll take a final question from Sophie Sanchez with Chicago Now. Hi, welcome back, Mark. Um, compared to your last flight, can you share what strengths you relied on most this flight? And since I'm assuming we'll see more long-term flights, what insights and takeaway do you have for new astronauts? Yeah, I, uh, I was much better about carving out time most days by and large most days, to meditate. And uh, I think that really helped me be more aware of how I was reacting to things and sometimes to just recognize that and decide to th see things differently. For and in general, for all of us, if we spend all day looking for the most negative things that are happening to us, it'll make our outlook on life pretty negative. And if we spend the um, times spend a little extra time focusing on the things to be grateful about, we'll end up feeling pretty good about things. So for me, I think noticing the times that I was reacting in a negative way and recognizing that I didn't have to do that helped me get through and, and recognize that, wait a minute, this is pretty cool. Even though this might be frustrating at, at the moment, trying to find a bag that's buried behind things and taking longer than I expected for it to take, I was still doing a pretty cool job and I was looking for bags behind a lot of other cargo in space. So it helped out. All right. Thank you so much, Mark, for taking all these questions today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. That's all the time we have for today. But please continue to follow updates from the International Space Station at nasa.gov station and on social media.